Chapter Four of Murder Madness by Mary Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bell stepped out of a tall French window to a terrace, and from the terrace to the ground. There was a dull muttering in the sky to the east, and a speck appeared, drew nearer swiftly, grew larger, and became a small army biplane. It descended steeply to earth behind a tall planting of trees. Bell lighted a cigarette and moved purposely down an elaborately formalized garden. More victims, he observed grimly to himself, of the plane. Ribera lifted a pigmented hand to wave languidly from a shaded chair. There were women about him, three of them, and it sickened Bell to see the frightened assiduity with which they flattered him. Bell had met them, of course. Madame, the wife of the state president of Bahia. In the United States of Brazil, the states have presidents instead of governors. Preferred the title of Madame because it was more foreign and consequently more aristocratic than Senora. And Madame, the wife of the general. Senor, called Ribiera blandly, I have news for you. Bell turned and went toward him with an air of pleased expectancy. He noticed for the first time the third of the woman, young, in the first flush of youthful maturity, but with an expression of stark terror, lingering behind a palpably assumed animation. An acquaintance of yours, senor, said Ribiria, is to be my guests. Bell steeled himself. The Senor Canalea, said Ribiria, beaming, and his daughter. Bell seemed to frown, and then seemed to remember. Oh, yes, he said carelessly. I met her in Washington. She was on the Almirante Gomez, coming down. The next instant he saw Ribiera's expression, and cursed himself for a fool. Ribiera's eyes had narrowed sharply. Then they half closed, and he smiled. She is charming, said Ribiera, in drowsy contentment. And I had thought you would be glad to improve her acquaintance, especially since, as my friend, you may congratulate me, a contract of marriage is under discussion. Bell felt every muscle grow taut. The fat, pigmented man before him. Indeed, said Bell politely, I do congratulate you. Ribiera looked at him with an expression in which sardonic admiration mingled with something else less pleasant. "'You are clever, Senor Bell,' he said heavily, seeming to sink more deeply into his chair. "'Very clever.' He shifted his eyes to the women who stood about him. "'You may go,' he said indifferently. His tone was exactly that of a despot dismissing his slaves. Two of them colored with instinctive resentment. His eyes lingered an instant on the third. Her face had shown only a passionate relief. You, senora, he said heavily, may wait nearby. The terror returned to her features, but she moved submissively to a spot a little out of earshot. Bell found his jaw clenched. There is a certain racial taint, widespread in Brazil, which leads to an intolerable arrogance when there is the slightest opportunity for its exercise. Ribiera had the taint, and Bell felt a sickening wrath at the terrified submission of the woman. See, si, said Ribiera, suddenly averting to insolence. You are clever, Senor Bell. Where did you learn of Yage? Bell inhaled leisurely. His muscles were tense, but he gave no outward sign. Instead, he sat down comfortably upon the arm of a chair facing Ribiera's. The only way to meet his insolence is with equal insolence and a greater calm. Ah, said Bell pleasantly, so you found out it didn't work after all. Ribiera's eyes contracted. He became suddenly enraged. You are trifling with me, he said furiously. Do you know the penalty for that? Why, yes, said Bell, and smiled amiably. A dose of... 
or poison of the master's private brand. It was a guess, but based on a good deal of evidence. Ribiera turned crimson, then pale. What do you know, he demanded, in a deadly quietness. You cannot leave this place, you are aware of that. The people here, guests and servants, are my slaves, the slaves of the master. You cannot leave this place except also as my slave. I will have you bound and given yog, so that you cannot fail to tell me anything that I wish to know. I will have you tortured, so that you will gladly say anything that I wish, in return for death. I will. You will, said Bell dryly, drop dead with seven bullets in your body, if you give a signal for anyone to attack me. Ribiera stared at him as his hand rested negligently in his coat pocket, and then, quite suddenly, Ribiera began to chuckle. His rage vanished. He laughed, a monstrous, gross, cackling laughter. "'You have been my guest for two days,' he gasped, slapping his fat knees. "'And you have not noticed that your pistol has been tampered with? Senor Bell, Senor Bell, my uncle will be disappointed in you.' It seemed to impress him as a victory that Bell had been depending upon an utterly futile threat for safety. It restored his good humor marvelously. It does not matter, he said jovially. Presently you will tell me all that I wish to know. More, perhaps. My uncle is pleased with you. You recall your little talk with the wireless operator on the Almirante Gomez? You tried to learn things from him, senor? He reported it, of course. All our slaves report. He sent his report to my uncle. The master, and I did not have it until today. I will admit that you deceived me. I knew you had talked with Ortiz, who was a fool. I thought that in his despair he might have spoken. I gave you Yag as I thought, and informed my uncle that you knew nothing. And he is very much pleased with you. It was clever to deceive me about the Yag. My uncle has high praise for you. He has told me that he desires your services. Bell inhaled again. There was no question but that Ribiera was totally unafraid of the threat he had made. His gun must have been tampered with. The firing pin filed off, perhaps. So Bell said placidly, Well, he desires my service. Ribiera chuckled in his gross and horrible good humor. He will have them, senor. He will have them. When you observe your hands writhing at the ends of your wrists, you will enter his service, through me, of course, and he will reward you richly, money, much money, such as I have, and slaves such as I have. The senora. Ribiera looked at the terrified girl, standing thirty or forty feet away. He chuckled again. My uncle desires that you should be induced to enter his service of your own will. So, senor, you shall see first what my uncle's service offers, and later, when you know what pleasures you may some day possess as my uncle's deputy in your own nation, why, then the fact that your hands are writhing at the ends of your wrists will be merely an added inducement to come to me, and I bear you no ill will for deceiving me. You may go. Bell rose. And still, he said dryly, I suspect that you are deceived, but now you deceive yourself. He heard Ribiera chuckling as he walked away. He heard him call, amusedly, Senora. He heard the little gasp of terror with which the girl obeyed. He passed her, stumbling toward the gross fat man with the light brown skin and curly hair. Her eyes were literally pools of anguish. Bell threw away a cigarette and began to fumble for another. He was beginning to feel the first twinges of panic and fought them down. Ribiera had not lied. Bell had been at this fazenda of his, which was almost a miniature Versailles, three hundred miles from Rio, for two days. In all that time he had not seen one person besides himself who did not display 
the most abject terror of Ribiera. Ribiera had made no idle boast when he said that everyone about, guests and servants, were slaves. They were slaves of a terror vastly greater than the mere fear of death. It... Senor, oh Dios! It was the girl's voice in despair. Riviera laughed. Bell felt a red mist come before his eyes. He deliberately steadied his hands and lighted his cigarette. He heard stumbling footsteps coming behind him. A hand touched his arm. He turned to see the girl Riviera had pointed out, her cheeks utterly chalky white, trying desperately to smile. Senor, she gasped, smile at me. For the love of God, smile at me. In the fraction of a second, Bell was mad with rage. He understood, and he hated Ribiera with a corrosive hatred past conception. And then he was deathly calm and wholly detached, and he smiled widely and turned and looked at Ribiera, and Ribiera's whole gross bulk quivered as he chuckled. Bell took the girl's arm with an excessive politeness and managed, he never afterward understood how he managed it, to grin at Ribiera. Senora, he said in a low tone, I think I understand. Stop being afraid. We can fool him. Come and walk with me and talk. The idea is that he must think you are trying to fascinate me, is it not? She spoke through stiffened lips. Ah, that I could die. Bell had a horrible part to play while he walked the length of the formal garden with her and found a pathway leading out of it and led her out of sight. He stopped. Now, he said sharply, tell me, I am not yet his slave. He has ordered you. She was staring before her with wide eyes that saw only despair. I, I am to persuade you to be my lover, she said dully, or I shall know the full wrath of the master. Bell asked questions, crisply, but as gently as he could. We are his slaves, she told him apathetically. I and me Arturo, my husband, both of us. She roused herself little under Bell's insistent questioning. We were guests at his house at dinner. Our friends, people high in society and in the Republic, were all about us. We suspected nothing. We heard nothing. But two weeks later, Arturo became irritable. He said that he saw red spots before his eyes. I also. Then Arturo's hands writhed at the ends of his wrists. He could not control them. His nerves were horrible. And mine. And we... We have a tiny baby. And Senor Ribiera called upon my husband. He was charming. He observed my husband's hands. He had a remedy, he said. He gave it to my husband. He became normal again. And then my hands writhed. Senor Ribiera told my husband that if he would bring me to him. And I was relieved. We were grateful. We accepted the invitation of the Senor Ribiera to this place. And he showed us a man in chains. He... He went mad before our eyes. He was a member of the United States Secret Service. And then the Senor Ribiera told us that we faced the same fate if we did not serve him. Bell had thrust aside rage as useless. Now he was deliberately cold. And so it is a poison, she said unsteadily, a deadly, a horrible poison, which drives men murder mad in two weeks from the time of its administration. The Senor Ribiera has an antidote for it, but mixed with the antidote, which acts at once, is more of the horrible poison, which will act in two weeks more, so that we are entrapped. If we disobey him... Bell began to smile slowly and not at all mirthfully. I think, he said softly, that I shall gain a great deal of pleasure from killing the Senor Ribiera. Dios, she strangled upon the word, do you not see, Senor, that if he dies, we, we, she stopped and choked, 
We have a tiny baby, senor. We, we would... Again, sick rage surged up in Bell. To kill Ribiera meant to drive his slaves mad, and mad in the most horrible fashion that can be imagined. To kill Ribiera meant to have these people duplicate the death of Ortiz, as their greatest hope were to fill madhouses with snarling animals lusting to kill. It is... It is not only I, senor, said the girl before him. She was utterly listless and in the agony of despair. It is Arturo also. The senor Ribiera has said that if I do not persuade you that both Arturo and I and our little baby, senor, our families will be entrapped some day. He has said so. He will give the poison to our baby and it will grow up either his slave or... Her eyes were pools of panic. Oh, God, said Bell very quietly, and he's offering me this power. He's trying to persuade me to become like him. He's offering me pleasures. He laughed unpleasantly, and then he went sick with helplessness. He could kill Ribiera, perhaps, and let only God know how many people go mad. Perhaps. Or perhaps Ribiera would merely be supplanted by another man. Ortiz had said that he killed the master's deputy in Buenos Aires, but that another man had taken his place, and the thing went on, and the master desired a deputy in the United States. Somehow, said Bell very softly, this has got to be stopped. Somehow. Right away. That devilish stuff. Can you get a hold of a bit of the antidote? he asked abruptly, the merest drop of it. She shook her head. No, senor, it is given in food, in wine. One never knows that one has had it. It is tasteless, and we have only senor Ribiera's word that it has been given. Bell's hands clenched. So devilish clever. What are we going to do? The girl stuffed the corner of her handkerchief into her mouth. I am thinking of my little baby, she said, choking. I must persuade you, senor. I, I have been tearful. I am not attractive. I will try. If I am not attractive to you. Bell cursed, deeply and savagely. It seemed to be the only possible thing to do. And then he spoke coldly. Listen to me, senora. Ribiera talked frankly to me just now. He knows that so far I am not subdued. If I escape, he cannot blame you. He cannot. And I am going to attempt it, if you will follow me. There is no escape for me, she said dully. And if he thinks that I knew of your escape and did not tell him... Follow me, said Bell, smiling queerly. I shall take care that he does not suspect. He gazed about for an instant, orienting himself. The plane that had just landed the last of a dozen or more that had arrived in the past two days, had dipped down on the private landing field to the north. There was a beautifully kept way running from the landing field to the house, and he went on through the thick shrubbery amid a labyrinth of paths, choosing the turnings most likely to lead him to it. He came out upon it suddenly and faced toward the field. There were two men coming toward the house, on foot, one was a flying pilot, still in his flying clothes. The other was a tall man, for a Brazilian, with a lucent clarity of complexion that bespeaks uncontaminated white descent. He was white-haired, and his face was queerly tired, as if he were exhausted. Bell looked sharply. He seemed to see a resemblance to someone he knew in the tall man. He spoke quickly to the girl beside him. Who is that man to the left? Senor Canaleas, said the girl dreamily. He is the minister of war. I suppose he too. Bell drew a deep breath. He walked on confidently. As the two others drew near, he said apologetically, Senors. They halted with the instinctive, at least surface, courtesy of the Brazilian. 
and Bell was fumbling with his handkerchief rather nervously, tying a knot in it. He held it out to Canalaeus. Observe. It was, of course, a recognition knot, such as may have been given to an outsider by one in the trade. The tall man's face changed, and Bell swung swiftly and suddenly, and very accurately, to the point of the other man's jaw. He collapsed. Senor Canalaeus, said Bell politely, I am about to go and steal an airplane to take what I have learned to my companion for transmission. If you wish to go with me... Canalaeus stared for a fraction of a second. Then he said quietly, But of course. He turned to retrace his steps. Bell turned to the girl. If you are wise, he said gently, you will go and give the alarm. If you are kind, you will delay it as much as you dare. She regarded him in agonized doubt for a moment and nodded. She fled. Now, said Bell casually, I think we had better hasten. And I hope, Senor Canalaeus, that you have a revolver. We will need one. Mine has been ruined. Without a word, the white-haired man drew out a weapon and offered it to him. I had intended, he said very calmly, to kill the Senor Ribiera. His last demand is for my daughter. They went swiftly. The plain bell had seen a light some fifteen or twenty minutes before was just being approached by languid mechanics. It was, of course, still warm. Canalaeus shouted and waved his arm imperiously. It is probable that he gave the impression of a man returning for some forgotten thing left in the cockpit of the plane. What happened then happened quickly. A few crisp words in a low tone. A minor hubbub began suddenly back at the house. Canalaeus climbed into the passenger seat as if looking for something, and Bell presented his now useless automatic pleasantly at the head of the nearest staring mechanic, and while he froze in horror, scrambled up into the pilot's cockpit. Contact, he snapped, and turned on the switch. The mechanic remained frozen with fear. Damnation, said Bell savagely. I don't know the Portuguese for Turner over. He fumbled desperately about in the cockpit. Something whirled. The propeller went over. Canalaeus shot with painstaking accuracy twice. The motor caught with a sputtering roar. As a horde of running figures, servants and guests, running with the same desperation, came plunging out on the flying field from the shrubbery. Bell gave the motor the gun. The fast little plane's tail came up off the ground as she darted forward. Faster and faster with many bumpings. The bumpings ceased. She was clear. And Bell zoomed suddenly to lift her over the racing, fear-ridden creatures who clutched desperately at the wheels. And then the little ship shot ahead, barely cleared the trees to the east of the field, and began to roar at her topmost speed toward Rio. End of Chapter 4